All right, so I'm going to be going through um, the first set of multiple choice questions on this practice test. And when I'm going through them, um, I'm going to try to show you the way that will allow you to complete the problem in the shortest amount of time possible, so the most efficient way. And that's because on the real exam, you'll get an hour for the first 30 multiple choice questions, which means you'll only have about two minutes for a problem. So um, you want to, you know, be efficient. You shouldn't you be efficient or be smart and not be spending time <clears throat> doing like TD's calculations and all this work. Because if you're going down a rabbit hole of all this long work, you're probably doing it wrong and you're probably wasting your time. Now, obviously, when I'm going through these, I'm going to show you the work and explain it to you uh, as clear as I can. So it's going to take you longer than two minutes for a problem, most likely. But, you know, I'm going to, again, just show you the way you should can, you should and can do them in less than two minutes. Um, so use it, you know, as you see fit. Anyway, so the problem one, we want to find the derivative of y with respect to x. We want to find dy dx and y is equal to x times the sine of x. So here we're going to use the product rule. We have two functions, x and sine of x. So we define dy dx. We take the derivative of x, which is one, multiply by the sine of x. And then we add x, we keep the first function as is, and we then multiply by the derivative of the sine of x, which is the cosine of x. And that'll be our function, or that'll be our answer. So that'll be b. Problem two, let f be, a function, be the function given by f of x is equal to 300x minus x cubed. On which of the following intervals is the function f increasing? Okay, so we can determine that a function is increasing by looking where the first derivative is positive. When the first derivative is positive, that means the function is increasing. When the first derivative is negative, that means it's decreasing. So let's first find the derivative function of f of x, which will be using power rule with 300 minus 3x squared. Now, to find where it could be increasing or decreasing, we essentially want to find where f prime is positive or negative. Now, we first want to figure out where f prime of x is undefined or where it's zero, because then we can know where to divide our intervals at. So we set this equal to zero and solve for x. Now we should get um. It's quickly looking at 10 and negative 10, but let me break it down. If we can factor out a three, times 100 minus an x squared. So then it means 100 minus x squared is going to be zero. So then x will be positive 10 and negative 10. So essentially, we want to break up our interval at negative 10 and 10 and study the behavior of f prime because then that will tell us if the function f is increasing or decreasing. So all we really care about is the sine of f. So let's just pick a number in each interval. So we can pick like f prime of let's say like negative of negative 20 in here. And then in here, let's, let's pick zero. Let's find f prime of zero. And in here, let's pick f prime of 20. So we find what each of those are. And again, we really care about this sign. You don't have to find the exact value as long as you know if it's positive or negative. So we're going to then essentially evaluate the function, evaluate this function or f prime of x for negative 20. And that'll be f prime of x will be 300 minus 3 times negative 20 squared, or 300 minus 3 times 40, or 300 minus 120. 300 minus 120, that's going to be, no, sorry, not 300 minus 120, 300 times 3, whoa, messed up there. 300 minus 3 times 20 squared, or 300 minus 3 times 400, 300 minus 1,200. Oof. And this is going to be negative 900. So that means the derivative is negative there, so that means the function f is decreasing, so I'm going to draw a down arrow. Now let's find f prime of zero. f prime of zero, we plug it in here. 300 minus 3 times zero. That'll just be 300. 
this is positive. The function is increasing here. And then now we find what f prime of 20 is. f prime of 20 is going to be the same as f prime of negative 20. It'll be 300 minus 1,200, which would be negative 900. Or just, we know it's a negative number, so we know it's decreasing. So we know the function f of x is increasing from negative 10 to 10. So the answer is b. Problem three. Okay, you make sure you um, have your derivatives memorized um, because they don't give you a formula sheet on your exam. I personally think it should, but it's just the way it is. So we have the integral of secant of x times tangent of x. So if you have your, you know, your integrals and derivative table memorized, we know that the antiderivative of secant of x tangent of x is just going to be secant of x. And again, we use our constant, so or we add our constant, so this will be secant of x plus c. So the answer is simply a. And that's because if we take the derivative of secant of x, we'll get secant of x tangent of x. That's just something you have to memorize. I mean, you can technically derive it and go through all the work, but definitely just know your you know derivatives of your cosine, sine, tangent, secant function. Um, at least those four. I mean, it's great if you know all of them, but those are the four most common. All right, four. If f of x equals seven x minus three plus the natural log of x and f times one is. All right, so we just then find the derivative of f of x, which is gonna be just seven minus, that's just minus zero, so seven minus zero plus the derivative of the natural log of x, which will be just one over x. So it's just seven plus one over x. And if we wanna find f time of one, we just evaluate this equation for x is one. So this will be seven plus one over one, which is just gonna be eight. And that'll be e. And then five. That always stay hydrated. All right, the graph of f is shown above. Which of the following statements is false? Okay, so let's just go through each one. The limit of f of x as x approaches 2 exists. So as x approaches 2 from the left, it's going to be f from the right. The limit of f of x as x approaches 2 is 2. So that exists. So this is a, this is um this isn't false. This is true. So that's okay. The limit of f of x as x approaches 3 exists. So as it approaches 3, it's going to approach, it's going to be 5 because it's it approaches the same number from both sides. So that's good. The limit of f of x as x approaches 4 exists. So when we approach 4 from the left, it would be like, it looks like something a little below negative or a little below 2. But when you approach 2 or 4 from the right, we're approaching um, 4. Because the limit as x approaches 4 from the left. Again, it's about, we'll just call it, you know, like 1.8. But the limit as f, as x approaches 4 from the right, from the positive side, is like about 4. So in order for the limit of f of x as x approaches 4 to exist in general, just like this, both of these have to be equal. Both the left-hand limit and right-hand limit have to be equal. So this is false. So the answer is C. Uh, particle moves along the x-axis. The velocity of the particle at time t is 6 t minus 10 t squared, where the full distance traveled by the particle from t equals 0 to t equals 3. For this, we're just going to integrate from 0 to 3 of this function, 6 t minus t squared. When you integrate the velocity function, that's going to give you the total distance that the velocity that, that the particle traveled from the you know from t equals zero to t equals three. When you integrate velocity, you get the you get the um, position equation or the position function. So the antiderivative of six t will be six t squared over two 
minus t cubed over three. From zero to three, we can integrate. This now is just algebra. This becomes just three t squared minus t cubed over three. From zero to three, we plug in three first, so three times three times three, so we get three times nine minus three squared minus 27 over three minus, oh, it'll just be zero, zero, we plug in zero both times. So this doesn't even matter. So it's just 27 minus nine, so it'll just be 18. And so be deep. Right along. All right, seven. If y equals x, it, well, let me just say the whole thing. If y equals x cubed minus cosine of x all to the fifth power, then y prime is. Let's just take the derivative of this. This is going to be chain rule. What we do is the, the derivative of the, on the outside is the power functions. We take the derivative of the outside, which is just five times x cubed minus the cosine of x, all to the fourth power. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inside, the derivative of x cubed minus cosine of x, which is three x squared plus the sine of x, because the derivative of of cosine of x is negative sine of x. So that would just make that a negative or positive. And then this we just multiply across that. And we don't think it's really simplify. So let's see what matches this. It'll simply be this one. And, you know, we need to like rewrite that in a more, you know, fancy way. And problem eight, the tank contains 50 liters of oil at time t equals four hours. Oil is being pumped into the tank at a rate of R of T, where R of T is measured in liters per hour, and T is measured in hours. So the values of R of T are given in the table above. Using the right Riemann sum with three subintervals and data from the table, what is the approximation of the number of liters of oil that are in the tank at time T equals 15 hours? Okay, so um, let's, um, let me just draw a visual of this, because um, this is actually, something that students tend to kind of like um, make this, for some reason I've definitely ha learned that students um, will usually struggle with these, with this at first. And I think it's because they don't want to draw a picture and, and do that extra work. But I really recommend that, especially when you're first learning this. Once you understand what's going on, then you can rely on that, you know, the quick formula that students love to memorize. Let me just show you what's going on. Um, let's just ignore the 50 at first, 50 for now. So. This is saying that at when we have our t, when t is four, we have four, seven, 12, 15. The R of t, we'll call this R of t, has these values, 6.5, 6.2, 5.9, definitely not drawing the scale. Let me just let me just tell you that right now. Five point six. Now, what what the idea is when we're talking about right Riemann sum, or just uh right, or like uh, maybe you heard like trapezoidal sum, is essentially you want to just find like an approximation for the area created by rectangles made with these points as the top right corner. So in other words, you're gonna have a rectangle that the first rectangle will look like this, the second one will look like this. Third one should be a little lower like that. The fourth one will be lower like that. And you're basically finding what area this is. That's what we mean by right Riemann sum, because you're taking the right side. If it said left Riemann sum, you would take the left value of each one. Um, anyway, so you just basically find the area of this. You find the area of the first rec that's called A1, A2, let me use my actual mind. A1, A2, A3, A4, and find the area of each of those and add them together. 
by simply using um, the formulas for a rectangle. So this A1 will have an area. The base is 4, 0 to 4, so be 4 times the height, which is just that 6.5 here. Plus A2, which is going to have a width or a base of 3, because 4 to 7 is 3. This 0 to 4 is 4. So 3 times this height over here at the top right corner, which is 6.2. Plus the next rectangle from seven to seven to twelve has a base of five. This one has a height of five point nine. Let's go to the next one. Just say that space. So plus plus the area of the fourth rectangle, which has a base of three. Twelve to fifteen is three times the height, which is five point six. We add all this together, and then we would get um. This is four point nine. So this there is sixty four point nine. Now let's not forget this part. It starts with 50 liters of oil. So we're just going to basically have 50 plus this, so this, so 50 plus that. And then that's what we'll get 114.9. Because that, that, when it starts, it's supposed to already have 50 in, in the band. And so that's all we have to do there. 